Hello everybody and welcome to this latest video in my series on the American Civil War, Causes, Course and Consequences. Today we're looking at a really important stage of Reconstruction. We're going to look at President Andrew Johnson and his attempt at presidential Reconstruction. Now this led to a huge clash with Congress and there's a huge back, going back and forth and there's a lot of arguing between them and Johnson really does not come off well in all of this. So President Andrew Johnson, so he saw Reconstruction as something that was for the executive, not for the legislature. So he saw, saw this as a job for the president, not for Congress. He wanted to restore all the southern states before Congress was due to meet again in December 65. Now, now, this initial part isn't hugely kind of odd in, in some ways, because, again, Lincoln had seen uh, Reconstruction as, as an executive uh, area of, of, of control as well, or it should be that it should be under executive control. He favoured speed in terms of reconstruction. He also favoured leniency. Um, he favoured states' rights over strong federal government. He did not believe in racial equality. He was looking to maintain white supremacy in the South. And this guy who'd been really, really angry about the actions of uh, of the South in the Civil War, and he called them all traitors, all this anger seems to disappear. His, his desire to punish the South um, seems to just go, and there's lots of questions as to why this is. Some people have suggested this is because he was, seek, he was thinking about re-election in 68. Some have suggested that this was bribery of various sorts, particularly from the planter class in the South. Some have suggested he just liked the fact that he, he, he can grant pardons and he has these former kind of southern great families coming and groveling for him and asking for his forgiveness. Right, so all of this is going to cause complications and Congress is going to resist it if it gets chance. So in May 65, Johnson recognises um, South, all Southern governments that have been formed the, under Lincoln's 10% plan. Uh, and he, he grants a, an amnesty to the, the poor whites in the South, Confederates who own less than $20,000 uh, worth of property, who were willing to take an oath of allegiance and, and accept emancipation. Again, not an enormous jump at this point from what uh, Lincoln had said and what Lincoln believed. Lincoln believed that the, the planter class had dragged the South into the war and, and the, the rest of the, the white population hadn't supported it. Former Confederate office holders were exempt from this initial, initial amnesty. Uh, over over the summer, other ex-Confederates, including a number of office holders, petitioned the president uh, for individual pardons, which he granted seemingly quite freely. Again, was there bribery or corruption of some sort going on here? We're not 100 percent sure. And, and he, his plan was to readmit these former states, and this required them um, to convene conventions and disavow their acts of secession, uh, agree to the uh, abolition of slavery uh, and um, to pay their war debts. Uh, Johnson uh, uh, appointed provisional state governors uh, to set up these state conventions. Uh, and as far as he was going, all this was going fairly um, smoothly. But this, the ex-Confederate states didn't really completely um, seek ball. Although all uh, sort of readmission, apart from Texas, um, there were some other issues. South Carolina ref refused to condemn its own act of secession. Mississippi refused to ratify the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, and quite a number of the states refused to pay their war debts. So Johnson now seemingly would have a, a significant um, problem, and he's going to get that problem once Congress is now back in session. On Christmas Day in 65, he, he gave an unconditional uh, pardon to all involved in the civil, civil war, apart from high-ranking military and civil officials. So He's going along this very lenient line, no punishment, lots of uh, lots of pardons. Uh, the South doesn't necessarily seem to be completely playing ball. Uh, and just to make this worse, it, the, the, this was a horrendous thing that was going on at the South at the time. They were called black codes. Now, they, they were very much based on the old slave codes that existed in these states, and they were designed to, to keep control over the freed people, stop them from gaining any form of equality and keeping them as, as second class citizens. And, and it required uh, black people to, to have a contract proving they had employment, otherwise they could be forcibly put to work again, very much like they had to carry a note on them under slave codes to show that they were off the plantation with permission. 
Um, uh, black children could be taken as apprentices, or really apprentices. They were then just put to work on, on plantations. Uh, there was a variety of different things in different black codes in different states. So they varied from state to state. And again, so you might want to do a bit of research into to find some of these differences. But there were various things in there. Uh, a quite common one was to prevent um, freedmen from marrying white people, to stop them um, buying definitely land, uh, and in some cases also renting it, uh, preventing from being on juries, and in, and in some states even um, really barred from being witnesses. Um, but in lots of places, um, receiving uh, poor relief and also remaining bans on education. So there really is, is, is a horrendous kind of stream of, of measures in there. And the violence, there's something else that was going on in this early part of Reconstruction, well, all the way through Reconstruction. Again, it can't be underestimated and, and um, it was absolutely horrendous. Now, there were 500 white men charged with killing black people in, in the southern Confederate, former Confederate states in the years 1865 and 1866, and none of them were convicted. And I, I think that highlights just how strong uh, the prejudice was and, and how corrupt uh, the system was in these former Confederate states at this point in time. Now, Johnson didn't necessarily condone, condone everything that was happening in the South, but because he was a believer, as we saw at the beginning, in this idea of state rights, he accepted the, the state's right to form laws as they saw fit, and he didn't believe in equality, and he didn't believe in, in black suffrage. Therefore, there, was, there seems to be nothing that would come from Johnson that would prevent any of this from happening. Now, Johnson then starts to clash with Congress because Congress comes back into session. So Johnson says, right, the union is restored. Uh, but Congress went, no, it's not. Uh, and it, essentially it refused to allow uh, the, the new representatives from the South to enter Congress and said, look, this is our right. We control our um, our own membership. This is not an executive issue. This is a legislative issue. We are the legislature. We will decide who we allow in or not. Now, Johnson had, had, had angered them um, with his leniency. They were angry about the black codes. And then just making things even worse, a lot of the Confederate um, from the representatives from the Confederate States had been elected. Well, they included the Vice President Stevens. There were four Confederate generals. There were 58 uh, former Confederate Congress members. And so Congress just said, we are not having you in. Um, and also, we don't recognise these new southern state governments because we, you aren't upholding uh, the Constitution as we as we see it. We don't. We you, there haven't been elections as we would we we would deem fit. Um, and so Congress reformed its Committee on Reconstruction, which is largely filled with moderate uh, Republicans, many of whom still hope they could work with Johnson. But we get a really quick indication that this isn't going to be the case because in February '66, Congress tried to pass. Um, a, a, a kind of an action, uh, further powers for the Freedmen's Bureau that would protect uh, the freedmen's rights against the black codes and, and what had been going uh, on in there. And again, it would they set up military courts um, and, and the bill passed and it passed very comfortably. Um, and then Johnson vetoed it. And so Congress had to pass it over his veto. Now, you, Congress can pass a uh, an act over a president's veto, but it requires a two thirds uh, majority in both houses. And, and they were able to do this because not only were the radical Republicans furious at Johnson, but the moderate Republicans now turned on him as well. So the Free Rounds Bureau's powers are improved. And again, this is a step towards nullifying or removing uh, the abuses of the black code. Now, Congress is, is still really concerned that the um, the rights of, of the freemen, the black people in, in, in the southern states are, are being abused. And they want to ensure they have this minimal level, minimum level of um, civil rights. And they, they focus on, on the idea of, of US citizenship for everybody who is born in the US. The, Native Americans are exempt, and, and that's a whole other um, a enormous can of worms in, in terms of uh, race relations in America. Um, and the act also gave federal government the right to intervene where states were not protecting US citizens' rights. Now, the bill sailed through both houses of Congress with no problems at all. Johnson, of course, vetoed it. Congress overrode his veto, getting two thirds in both houses again. 
A further, a further Freedmen Bureau Act is passed. Again, Johnson vetoes it. Again, uh, Congress passes it over his veto. So what we're seeing here is a, a clash between um, the executive and the legislature. Now, you get that in America quite often, and, and normally it results in some kind of gridlock where one just nullifies the other and nothing happens. But because the Republicans are so dominant in Congress, they are able to go over Johnson's veto and over Johnson's veto and keep pushing things out, uh, pushing things forward. And one of the things you have to consider is where, where, where the blame for all this problem lies. Is Johnson acting completely um, indefensibly and completely irrationally? Or is this a, um, does some of the blame for this clash lie with Congress? So looking to secure uh, the, the rights are uh, uh, put forward in the Civil Rights Act in 1866. Congress then uh, supports a 14th Amendment, which would guarantee uh, citizens' rights for those born in America going forward. So uh, it plays a really important role in American politics, the 14th Amendment. It also banned from office all, all Confederate office holders down from the president to a postmaster. Uh, and Therefore, there's a delay in the 14th Amendment passing because southern states do not want to ratify it. And there is horrendous violence again at this stage in the South. We, we see um, uh, lots of riots in the summer of 66, notably in Memphis and New Orleans, uh, and over eight black people are killed in this. And again, we're seeing difficulty in, in the people responsible for these riots being held to account. The midterm elections in 1866 are, are really significant and Johnson campaigns. There's a, a new movement, political movement that developed the National Union movement uh, and it supported Johnson and his policies. And it was mainly made up of, of Democrats with some conservative Republicans joining in. Um, Johnson arguably does a lot more harm than good in all of this. It, when heckled, and he often was heckled when he was speaking in the major cities, he, he completely lost his temper and was yelling back at people, appeared <coughs> completely undignified. It's difficult to imagine, of course, a, a, a US president uh, giving public um, speeches and then uh, seeming to be hugely undignified and ranting. I, I know, difficult to imagine. Um, there have been some significant parallels drawn between Johnson and a, a current, the, the current uh, US president, actually, on, on many of these matters. Uh, the National Union movement uh, did not become a new party, which is what Johnson was really pushing for, and essentially everybody saw it for what it was, which was essentially the Democrats under a new name. Um, the Republicans who were campaigning against them could very easily point back to the war, and they could point at, at, at Johnson undoing the, the work of the war, and they could point to the Democrats having essentially supported the other side. And the Republicans' key role in winning the war, and this galvanised a lot of Northern support. So the Republicans won all but three states. It's worth noting, of course, that the Confederate states have not been readmitted at this point, so that they're not taking part in this election. And so the Republicans have got a comfortable two-thirds majority in both houses. So this is really bad news for Johnson. And what they then pass next is really, really bad news uh, for Johnson. The, the Military Reconstruction Act, this is Congress taking a firm control of, um, of Reconstruction. Only Tennessee, amongst the former Confederate states, is recognised as having a, a legal government. Um, the former Confederacy is then divided into five military districts, under, each under a federal commander. And to re-enter, re not only do these states have to accept the 13th Amendment, they now have to accept the 14th Amendment and black suffrage. Of course, Johnson vetoes it. Of course, Johnson's veto is overridden. And Congress goes further, and this is the point where, where I mean, up to this point, you, you can see all the bad things Johnson's done and all the, the terrible ideas that he, he, he's pushing. But also, at this this point, we've got to say, well, there's some powers here which we would recognise as being a president's, and these powers are being undermined. Now, you could say this has been done with good reason, but there are powers you'd expect a president to have which are being undermined. So the Command of the Army Act reduces his military powers. Now, this, this is due to a, a fear that he would prevent the important work the military was doing in terms of reconstruction. It's linked to the Military Reconstruction Act, which he has just tried to veto. So you can see why it's been done, but the president is commander in chief of the armed forces. We also have the tenure of office act, which barred him from removing officials from office, including members of his own cabinet. And again, the president 
is chief of the executive, head of the executive. So you expect him to have control of offices within the executive and this not really be a place for Congress. But Congress had a reason for doing this. The Tenure Office Act was aimed to protect the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, who was a, a long running critic of Johnson, very outspoken critic of him and supporter of the radical Republicans in Congress. Um, Johnson vetoed the bill, as you would expect, and the veto was overridden, as you would expect. He then told Grant that he still intended to sack Stanton and, and actually he's essentially, he does offer Grant the position. So he says, right, you, Grant, do you want to be Secretary for War? Um, Grant says to Johnson, look, look, this is a really bad idea. And, and Seward says to Johnson, this is a really bad idea. It looks pretty much like shouting at someone, it's a trap, and then just walking straight into it. So Johnson does sack Santon. He offers the job to Grant. Um, Congress votes to reinstate Stanton. Grant turned down the job. No, part of what he said to a believe at the time is he could face a large fine and prison time if he'd taken it. Also, he's thinking about uh, running as president in 68. Uh, Lorenzo Thomas is then appointed by Johnson and takes the job. Johnson has broken the law. Johnson is impeached. The House voted 126 to 48 to impeach him in February 1868 for high crimes and misdemeanours. And you can clearly see what they're saying he's done. There was then a two month trial at the end of which the, the Senate voted 35-19 against Johnson. But crucially, this was one vote short of the number needed to convict him. And this was, in, this was due to a Republican turning around and going, actually, that was a trap um that that you you've set for him it's not a high crime misdemeanor it's not the most sensible politics ever but so although it looks like he's convicted he isn't actually convicted because he need they needed that two-thirds majority at this point johnson is a lame duck um and it seems like there's nothing else he can do so you've got a very angry johnson who has been stripped of all his powers and 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 essentially um completely uh, railroaded by Congress. However, he does have one last parting shot before his presidency ends and Grant takes over. And this is another one of his amnesties. And this is another Christmas Day amnesty, this one in 1868. And he gives a universal amnesty and pardon for participants in the rebellion uh, will be extended to all who, who have borne any part therein with restoration of all rights, privileges and immunities under the constitution. So even those who held high office in the Confederacy, in the military, in the Confederacy, they are all now pardoned. So there is nothing that Congress can do to pursue them or punish them. And so Johnson has really freed the former Confederates up to, to try and do their best to regain power in the South. Right. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you, you, you found that informative. The key things you need to be thinking about when you're watching this is, well, why does this, this clash uh, happen between Johnson and Congress? What are the rights and the wrongs on either side? And also the consequences of what's going on, particularly on the freedmen in the South. So again, this is part of a playlist that looks at the causes, uh, course and consequences of the Civil War. So again, please like, subscribe for um, further updates and to get new videos as they come out and to support the channel. Thank you very much again for watching.